Welcome to Brew Cheese, where we brew up the finest of cheese. I'm Micah, and thanks for tuning in. If you're new to our channel, we brew up Commander decks on a $50 budget, often with an unexpected twist. This makes my second mono black Commander deck in a row, but I've got a soft spot for two things, mono black decks and underdogs. And I believe Karavek here is much better than people give him credit for. He's two black black for a 3-2 human warlock, and he has a single line of text. Other creatures get minus one, minus one. A lot of people want to see this as just a night of souls betrayal in the command zone, and well, they're right, and they're not right. If we just reword Kirovek's ability a little bit, and ta-da! Now it's a pretty useful ability. Everyone auto sacks all X1 creatures they have all the time. While that's not great wording for your typical magic card, it is an ability we can make use of. So how are we going to do that? To put it simply, we're going to put as many X1 creatures on the battlefield as we can and have them automatically die and reap the benefits. Some of those will be tokens, as one toughness tokens are the de facto standard. But we're also running some one toughness creatures that have this pesky tendency to reappear on the battlefield, since some of our payoffs care only about non-token creatures. For the ramp package, we're slightly limited. Normally, I can turn to creatures like Lead and Mirror and Mannequin to be low-costed mana generation, but we've painted ourselves into a bit of a corner here in that our commander will auto-kill these. So instead, we're turning primarily to non-creature ramp, starting with Charcoal Diamond and Star Compass, which produce black for an initial 2-mana investment. The Charcoal Diamond enters tapped and Star Compass requires you to have a swamp. Prismatic Lens produces colorless, but it can also filter our other colorless mana into Black Forest by pumping it into it and tapping it. Pyramid of the Pantheon lets us spend 2 mana to produce the black mana we need, so it puts us a bit behind on production for a while, but once we've activated that 3 times, it taps for 3 black each time. Mindstone produces colorless and gives us the option to pay 1 and tap and sack it to draw a card. Palladium Mirror taps for 2 colorless and has a large enough toughness to survive Kirovic's ability. Springleaf Drum lets us tap one of our creatures to produce black, which is ideal since a lot of creatures in this deck don't need to tap for anything else, Karavik included, so we can make more use of them. Finally, Unstable Obelisk taps for one and also has the ability to pay seven into it, tap and sec it to destroy any permanent. Not the best rate, but black has a terrible time dealing with enchantments and artifacts, and this gives us a way to do that. Arguel's Bloodfast lets us pay 2 and 2 life to draw a card, which is a pretty decent rate. It has a second mode that will hopefully never come up, but one you might be happy for if it ever does. If we're ever at 5 or less life at our upkeep, it transforms into Temple of Aklozots, a land that taps for black or lets us tap it and sack a creature to gain life equal to its toughness, thus giving us some sort of safety net. Underworld Connections lets us give one of our lands the ability to tap to draw us a card at the cost of one life. Obnixilus Reignited's plus one draws us a card at the cost of one life, but it can also be ticked down by three to kill a creature, which is sometimes its best ability. If we can get to enough loyalty, we can minus eight him to give an opponent an emblem that hits them for two anytime somebody draws a card. Most of the time though, we're more interested in his first two abilities. Since there's a lot of creature death happening, we might as well harness that and draw some cards. Dark Prophecy does just that every time one of our creatures dies, and hits us for one. Grim Harrispex draws us a card when one of our non-token creatures bites the dust, as does Midnight Reaper, with it also hitting us for one when it triggers. Blurring the line between draw and tutor is Jar of Eyeballs, which gets two eyeball counters every time one of our creatures dies. We can pay 3, tap, and remove all those counters to dig that many cards deep and pick one to put in our hand. Since we're a bit of an aristocrat's deck, and as such need some specific pieces to be successful, it only makes sense to play some tutors. Diabolic Tutor lets us grab any card we need to get our engine up and running. Final Parting allows us to grab two cards and put one of them into our graveyard. Considering we have a lot of creatures that can make their way back out of the yard, that effectively lets us get two of our pieces. It's a little pricey at market value, but I found plenty of copies online for less than a dollar, so I think it's doable. Before we get to our suite of creatures that treat our graveyard like a revolving door, we'll cover the other things that trigger when creatures die. We can't use Blood Artist or Zillaport Cutthroat here because they both have one toughness, but what we can use is Bastion of Remembrance, which not only makes a 1-1 token, 
but also says that whenever one of our creatures dies, each opponent loses a life and we gain a life. It's notable that the Bastion will be on the battlefield when state-based actions are checked, so it will see the token that it may die. We're also running Vindictive Vampire, which has the same effect, except it's damage-based, and Falcon Wrath Noble, which has a single player lose a life and you gain a life, but this triggers on anyone's creature dying. Sir Conrad the Grim deals one to each opponent whenever a creature goes to or from the graveyard, which are both things that happen a lot with this deck. You can pay one in a black to have each player mill one, an ability we won't be using an awful lot, but it's handy to remember when an opponent uses something like Vampiric or Enlightened Tutor that puts their card on top. We can just mill it away. Butcher of Malakir has each opponent sack a creature anytime one of our own creatures dies, which is going to happen a lot. A similar effect comes from Reaper from the Abyss, which lets us destroy any non-demon creature at the end of each turn in which a creature died. We also have a collection of cards that either make creatures get bigger as stuff dies, or is itself a creature that grows when things die, starting with Blade of the Blood Chief, which puts a plus one plus one counter on the equipped creature anytime something dies. If that equipped creature is a vampire, it gets two of those counters instead. Sadistic Glee is almost the same effect, but in a one black aura and doesn't double up for vampires. Eternal Thirst is an aura that gives a creature lifelink and the ability to get a plus one plus one counter when an opponent's creature dies. Gavin and Hallowed and Silumgar Scavenger both get counters when our creatures die, except that the Scavenger has flying and can let us sack a creature when it enters in order to give it haste. So let's go over the fodder that fuels our engine. This first group of cards mix tokens, often in large numbers. The first we'll cover is one of my favorite cards to use in any deck that both sacrifices a lot and deals in plus one plus one counters, which is this deck. Animation module lets you pay one when a plus one plus one counter goes on one of our creatures, and we make a one one servo. So if we have this in something like Silumgar Scavenger, and the Scavenger gets a counter, we can pay one. When we do, we make a token that dies instantly. That triggers the scavenger to get another counter, which lets us make another servo if we want to pay one, and so on until we have no more mana to pay. Each loop also has a creature dying, so we trigger a lot of our other effects each time as well. Every time we cast a creature, Indrik Sar makes X11 thralls, where that was the creature's casting cost. If you ever have seven or more thralls, you have to sacrifice Indrik, something that is checked when state-based actions are checked, so even though Kervik makes the token 0, zero if the creature you cast to trigger Indrik is CMC 7 or higher, you'll still have 7 of those before they die. Fortunately, there's only 2 7 CMC creatures in the deck, and one of them is a board wipe. Spoilers. With Genesis Chamber, players create a 1-1 mirror anytime a non-token creature enters their battlefield. The mirror tokens will of course die when they become 0-0s. Zero, zeros. Infernal Genesis has each player mill 1 on their upkeep, and based on the CMC of that milled card, they make that many minion tokens. Sometimes this will get a land and whiff, but oftentimes will yield a nice little pile of zero zeros. When Acro and Horse enters the battlefield, it does so under an opponent's control. At their upkeep, everybody but that player creates a 1-1 soldier. You know where this is going. Dreadhorde Invasion simply amasses one on our upkeep, which usually results in the 1-1 army dying, so long as it didn't start building up prior to our commander hitting the field. Lightning Coils gets a charge counter whenever one of our non-token creatures dies, and on our upkeep we remove all those counters and make that many 3-1 elementals. In the event that they get to stick around after our upkeep, they have haste and are exiled at the end of our turn. The best non-token fodder we have are those cards that come back from our graveyard to the battlefield just to die again because they have one toughness. In that category, we start with Ashen Ghoul, which any time during our upkeep we can pay a black and return to the battlefield. We can only do this if there are three or more creatures above it, and no, you can't rearrange your graveyard to make this happen. Despoiler of Souls gets to come back out to play if we can pay two black and exile two other creatures out of our graveyard. Icarid lets you exile one other black creature from your graveyard at the beginning of your upkeep to put it back on the battlefield. If it sticks around, you'll have to sack it at the end step. Reassembling Skeleton simply lets you pay one in a black to put it back into play from your graveyard. The second best thing we can do for some recursion are creatures that come back to our hand from the graveyard so that we can cast them again. That category kicks off with Endless Cockroaches, which does exactly that. 
brood of cockroaches, on the other hand, comes back on the next end step at the cost of one life. Undead Gladiator comes back to our hand at the cost of two mana and a card, and can be cycled away if need be. You'll notice that some of those creatures require us to have other creatures in the graveyard either on top of them or to exile, and that leads us to the last category of fodder, and that's creatures that make tokens when they die or enter, so they're mostly one-shot deals. The first in this category is Carrier Thrall, which makes a 1-1 Scion when it dies, which can be sacrificed for one if it sticks around. Discordant Piper makes a 0-1 Goat when it dies, while Mere Sire makes a 1-1 Mirror when it does. Weaponcraft Enthusiast brings two servos to the dead man's party when it enters, and although you can elect for it to come in with those plus one plus one counters instead of the tokens, what's the fun in that? Because the commander is so integral to our strategy, we want to protect it as much as possible. To do that, we'll incorporate one of my favorite finds, Blessing of Leeches. Has flash, costs nothing to regenerate the creature, and we lose just one measly life a turn. Plus, super sweet Rebecca Gway artwork. What's not to love? Almost as good is Soul Channeling, which lets us regenerate a creature for the cost of two life. Kaya's Ghost Form returns the creature or Planeswalker, it's enchanting to play if it gets killed or exiled, but it's a one-shot protective aura. Finally, Mask of Avacyn and Mirror Shield provide Hexproof, not to mention a slight stats bump. Our removal takes advantage of what our deck is already doing, and uses it to our, uh, well, advantage. Tragic Slip gives a creature minus one minus one until end of turn for a single black at instant speed, or minus 13 minus 13 if a creature died this turn, something we can probably manage. Speaking of creatures dying, Malicious Affliction destroys a non-black creature or two of them if another creature died this turn. Ruinous Path and Never to Return both destroy a creature or planeswalker, with Return recastable to give us a zombie token, and Path castable for 7 if for some reason we want to turn one of our lands into an easily removable 3-3, since it'll get minus 1 minus 1. Heartless Act either destroys a creature with no counters on it, or removes 3 counters from a creature. Price of Fame destroys a creature, but costs even cheaper if destroying a legendary one. We also get to Surveil too. Farika's Libation either forces an opponent to sacrifice a creature or an enchantment, our choice. One of our few ways to deal with enchantments. Our board wipes also play to our strengths. Languish gives all creatures minus four minus four until end of turn, and combined with the minus one minus one of our commander, we stand to wipe a good portion of the board. Deadly Tempest and Extinguish All Hope are primarily here just to wipe the board. The life loss from Tempest is nice, but we're not running any enchantment creatures to take advantage of Extinguish, but it spares fewer creatures than does my usual standby of Crux of Fate. After all, we don't want any dragons hanging around on the battlefield. Speaking of dragons, Deathbringer Regent not only wipes the board, but leaves us a 5-6 beater in the air. Finally, in Garrick's Wake destroys all of our opponent's creatures and planeswalkers. We get to even continue our removal in our collection of lands. Cabal Pit sacks for a single black to give a creature minus two minus two until end of turn, while If Near Deadlands lets us pay four tap and sack it to put two minus one minus one counters on a creature. Combined with our commander's ability, a total of minus three minus three will kill an awful lot of creatures. Oh, and they produce mana too, I guess. Labyrinth of Scophos and Mystifying Maze both help to protect us, letting us pay four and tap them to save us from an attacker. Both also tap for colorless. Myriad Landscape either produces colorless or lets us pay two, tap, and sack it to go get two tapped swamps into play, providing some level of ramp. Rogue's Passage is great to not only get in some incidental extra damage, but also to get a creature through that we've built up with plus and plus encounters. It produces colorless. Seagate Wreckage and Arch of Araska both produce colorless and let us draw cards if we're empty handed or if we have the city's blessing, respectively. Finally, we wrap things up with 28 Swamps. The total cost for this deck came up to $46.20. These prices are powered by TCG Player, not a sponsor, using optimized pricing. The total does include shipping and allows for cards of any condition. Thank you for watching, and if you like what we're doing here, subscribe or share this video with a friend, or leave a comment telling us what we missed or what you'd like to see in the future. See you again next video.